Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Welcome to part seven. Yes, lucky seven of the Philco Predictor Princess repair. In the previous video, we got our power supply issues worked out and we got a full screen raster. So now it's time to work on the important things that make the picture and sound, which would be the IF and the tuner and probably the audio stage. Off camera, uh, I have replaced the final two film caps that were hiding back there and also upgraded our rectifiers to some 1 in 5408s. 3 amp at 600 volt is uh, I'm sure more than enough considering the originals were I believe only 1 amp or 1.5 amp each. So I'd like to be a little more overbuilt. So now what we need to do is get the shield off of this and then take a look at the board and get the board up. And to accomplish that, we need to bend all these little tabs so that the shield will pass through the holes there and we can lift it out. And uh, also make sure to undo the little cable clamp that's for your coaxial there. And we'll need to remove some wires too, but first let's get the shield up. So let me get this on the mount so we can see it a little better. I'm sure I'm going to bump the crap out of everything, so bear with me a bit. Let me see if I can get an appropriately sized tool. And your goal is to just straighten these out without bending them too much, because if you do, you'll fatigue them and then they'll break. So we just want to get it enough so that they pass through the holes here and we can get the shield off. And just wiggle and jiggle until you can feel them pass through without any kind of real resistance. It's always one or two that are gonna fight you. We've got this one up here. All right, looks like it's starting to come up. So let's put this back down. Now we should be able to lift off the shield, which we can. And there's our exposed board. And whatever you do, be very careful around these coils and these ceramic trimmers there. Because if you bust any one of those, good luck. Same with these peaking coils here at the output there. You can see those. Very fragile things. Definitely some water intrusion uh, here at some point, for sure. And what we notice here is that some of these are soldered already, which meant that either a previous technician did that, or they were done from the factory and And <clears throat> definitely signs of water intrusion. So we have to take a look at the bottom of the pins and make sure that there's no rust creeping up the pins, which would uh, interrupt the vacuum seal and kill these tubes. The General Electric one obviously being a replacement. And let's see, that's an original Philco right there, 6DE6. That came out too easy. There's another 6DE6. I just love their strange tubes. Everyone else used 6ES6 or 6CB6 or something like that, but they wanted to be different. So, anyways, <clears throat> let's focus on getting the board out. So what I'm going to do is start undoing wire wraps, which is no fun, but have to do it. And what I do is I just very lightly, just enough to catch the wrap, 
squeeze down and unwrap them little by little. See how it's starting to slide up now? We're going to solder these back down, so I'm not worried about the wrap part of it. I hate wire wraps. I'd rather it just be plug-ins or solders. If you were doing a lot of serviceability on this, you would definitely want plug-ins. But since my goal here is to never have to do any real work on this ever again. See, this one's trying to fight me. There we go. Now it's coming up. And I'm keeping the wires in place because obviously there's not a whole other lot of places they can go. Get that one's soldered. And this is also a hold down for the board, so we'll have to make note of that. And let's undo these guys up here. And it's basically just going to be like the main board, which is, you know, replacing the tube sockets and any out of tolerance resistors. They're all ceramic caps here, so we don't have to worry about drifty McDrift face, uh, paper or wax caps or anything. And I think what I want to do now is focus on unsoldering these guys here and the one in the back. Which you can barely see back here, but there it is. I need to try to get him loose. a little heat as I unwrap. Okay, so he's up. Now we get to work on that guy. There's a wire wrap over there I missed, but we'll get to that in a minute. This one Obviously, because I don't want to damage that, I'm just going to clip it, and we'll solder it, strip and re-solder it when we get to that point. Because I don't want to overheat that ceramic capacitor. This is all getting redone anyways. But we'll just leave that one up. And then there's one back here behind this tube shield that you can't really see. You ever work on Pioneer stereo gear from the 60s or 70s? It's all wire wrapped like this too. Very few people had the patience to rewrap everything after they serviced it, so they usually just soldered it down. Okay, I think that is the majority, if not all, of the wire wrap connections. So, now what I have to do is get these guys up here. And you don't want to use pliers to grab these. You want to use a hook tool. Because using pliers will absorb more heat, and it will take you longer to get them up versus just resting your soldering iron on it as you tug upwards with the uh, pick. That comes right up. Let that cool before I put it back down. That way it doesn't restick itself. Do the one in the back here. Same method. Trying not to slip and murder everything in sight. Well, I'm sorry, I can't say that word. It's one of those forbidden words. I have to say unalive. Where have we gotten to? Okay. And then I'm going to try this guy back here. I know, this is like the horribly boring part. If you don't want to watch it, skip ahead to something cooler. 
And since I'm just shooting this video, I don't know what that's going to be yet. Well, I'm not even making contact with the piece of metal. That's why it's not coming up. Come on. I hear you. You're moving. All right, there's another one. And then there's the one up front here which is also attached to that capacitor. I'm a little leery of that. But we got to get it up somehow. Now there's a joke in there somewhere, but just not in the mood today. Come on. I yeah, know, there we go. Up, up and away. Come on, harden up. There we go. And then I got two more, which are over here at the edge. You got this guy here, which you can't really see because of that wire bundle that's in the way. And then you got the one on the back side. Yeah, let's see if we can get a better angle for heat in here. <clears throat> oh yeah, it's softening up now. There we go. Pull that guy up. We're almost there. Just got one more back here to do. I can't really give a better bird's eye. There's just not enough room for me, the camera, and everything else. And there we go. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Still feels like it's being held on by something. Maybe this one here in the corner. Yeah, I'm thinking so. Come on. Where are you? Oh. I see there. There's a big old blob of solder that trickled down into the hole. Whip that away. Almost there. Also, it looks like the tab's a little bent, too, so let's see if we can straighten that out. Okay. Looks like same with this one over here. Just soften the solder a little bit. Okay. These boards are so fragile, I just don't want to exert any real force on them for fear of creating more work for myself. Get some of this stuff out of the way. And there we go. Boards out. And we'll worry about cleaning up all of these adds here later okay let me get the chassis off the bench and then we can take a look at the board all right so here's our IF board it's pretty dirty I'm not going to use quite the aggressive cleaning method that I did on the main board because there are lots of little fragile coils and things that if I damage them we're SOL we've got one nine pin socket to replace and we've got two seven pin sockets and thankfully they just have the solder adjacent terminal shield so we don't have to come up with anything too fancy like we did on the main board uh, with that integral slide up shield so 
what I'm going to do is uh, basically just take some CRC QD, which has very quick drying solvents in it, and spray down the board. And then we'll get to uh, replacing components. Back side of it's actually really good looking. So not a lot of heat generated here. This is still mostly a green color. There's not too much heat buildup. The tube sockets are still well soldered. I'm going to replace them though because these sockets become problematic. And uh, two of them were excessively tight and the one on the far right was loose. So definitely not leaving those in there. But uh, first things first here, let's get to cleaning it. And I'm just going to hose it down, let it dry, and then we'll come back to this. Okay, so we're cleaned up a little bit. It's a little bit nicer looking. Um, just waiting for everything to dry. And while we're doing that, I think we'll ohm out some of these coils and things to make sure that they're alive. And make sure that there's nothing that I have to try to repair or source uh, that would really slow this down and place this meter in a spot where we can all see it it's a little better and i just want to make sure that all these little important peaking coils are alive because if they're not we're going to have issues Here, we'll do this guy. And there's one over here. Yeah, so there, all those are happy. Let's check the uh, little IF cores here. Find out which one's the primary and which one's secondary I'll probably have to look at the schematic to be sure it's almost easier to just do them from the bottom side Yeah, that looks good. And we got this dude here. Okay. That dude there. All right, so those are happy. And then we'll start checking for out of tolerance resistors. Definitely going to change some out if I have to. That should be 330, that's 369. That's 10% though. That's, I don't know, that's right at the limit. I can replace you though. Why not? IF performance is key to a good picture. Here's another 330 ohm. 370. So I'll put these little green marks on things. This looks like a 150 or 15K rather. I think he's shunting a coil. I think he's probably shunting the coil there, so I can't really get a good reading on him. I have to lift one leg out and test it. And this looks like 120 ohms, which is measuring 150, so that one's out. And here's another one here. It looks like a 1K. One 1.3 megs. Really? Yeah. Really. That dude right there. Brown, black, red. That's a one. It's supposed to be a 1K. Measure it from the back side just to be sure I'm not picking up any gunk. There we go. So, for all you that were curious, he's still 1K. Uh, just couldn't read through all the crud. 
So let's see this other one here. <clears throat> Excuse me, this 15K or whatever it's supposed to be. Yeah, he's shunting the uh, IF core, so that's never going to get a reading unless I lift that up. Here's a 220K, which is measuring across something else, so can't really judge that one very well. Here's what's supposed to be a 22K. Yep, 18 in circuit is pretty good. Here's another 1K. That's all right. This one's supposed to be 27K, looks like. Of course, he's shunting the uh, IF core. So we'll have to check both that one and the 100 and, and the 15K, I think it was. It's supposed to be 100K. It's measuring lower in circuit. That makes sense. Another 1K. And I think you're a 22K. So you're again across the core. And then we got 100 ohms measuring 60 in circuit, so that's good. So not a whole lot that's out of spec. The 330s for sure. And then the 120 or whatever it was. I think that was this guy here measuring 149. So we need to change those three and then lift uh, one leg of these resistors here. Let's do that real quick and just see if we're actually what we say we are. That's really the only way to check it is just get it out of the circuit because it's... <clears throat> part of a reactance network with a capacitor and it's all shunting one of the cores so you're not going to be able to know uh, let's see I think yep that's the one I want all right and we just have to get it away from the Have to get it away from that. No, nothing. I can't get you far enough away from the solder pad. Yeah, I saw 14.8 something. Take away more solder. I saw 14.87, which is close enough to 15K, but I just want to verify that with absolute certainty. Sixteen point one actually. Alright, so sixteen K out of fifteen K is totally acceptable. That's less than 10%, so we're good with that one. We'll solder that one back down. Let's check the other one, which I believe was this 27K. Yep, that's another one that's shunting the network. And I highly doubt that it would make a tremendous difference like night and day if one of those resistors was defective but it would definitely affect the picture and sound. So we're just going to be thorough. I like being thorough. It means that I don't have to come back and fix something that I missed earlier, or at least I can't say that it won't happen. It'll just be a much lower probability. And life is about probabilities in statistics. One could argue. And then, let's see here. What did they say? This one was supposed to be 27K or some such nonsense. Come on, come away from the pad. 
Nope, it's not going to do it for me. We just got to keep at it until we suck all the solder out of here. And again, if this is boring you guys, skip ahead. I'm just trying to be thorough with this thing. I do not like working on predictors because of the amount of attention to detail that you have to have for everything to work. See, now that measures 31. And that was a, what, a 27K? So I'm, I'm going to change that one out. That one's just a little bit too too much out. Make a mark here. And then finally, let's see. There was one more here, wasn't there? I think it was like this 22K here. That was in circuit. Let's double check. Yeah, that guy there. And he's definitely shunting that network there. So let's pull this up. So, so far we've got some resistors to replace, no real shocker there. I was expecting that. And so let's come over here and measure this. 24K out of 22K, that's still very acceptable. That's within less than 10%. Just a hair under 10%, so we're going to leave that one alone. Uh, but the 27 measuring about 32, that's getting close to 15 there. So I am going to change that. So not too bad. Uh, make a little diagram. And then we'll get to uh, removing the tube sockets. And to save a little bit on time, uh, I'll do that off camera since you saw me do it on the other ones. But we're just going to remove the tube sockets, take them out, uh, take the shields out. And then replace them with our nice fancy new ceramic ones. And then uh, replace the resistors, do all the soldering necessary on the board. And then pop the board back in. And then we'll work on the tuner. Alright, so here we are. I've got the new tube sockets in. Looking nice and fresh there. I had to make a little extension leads for the shield here. But that's just par for the course I guess the other two went in fine we replaced our out of tolerance resistors let me turn this on here Thought we were a little less shaky um, went over the board resoldered the entire board ohmed out all the traces and everything looks good so it's time for this to go back into the set and then we can take a look at the tuner and see what needs to be done on the tuner. Usually they just clean up and lube and they're good to go. And then we can finally get this thing together and see if it will produce real picture and sound. But uh, again, I'm not going to go nuts on cleaning the board here because these coils and things are, in my opinion, too delicate to uh, risk damaging. Since they all loam out and they're happy, we're going to leave them be. So let me get this thing back in the set. And then we'll take a look at the tuner. Well, there it is. All back in the chassis. Shield on it. Tubes in. We're ready to take a look at the tuner. And then once we get the tuner done, we'll hook everything up together and see how it runs. All right, so here's the tuner. And we need to make sure that this antenna bone connection is okay. Probably replace that capacitor there. We'll pop the cover open and check the wafers and check all the little parts inside. Check the frictional coupler there for fine tuning. And there's all your slugs to adjust uh, the channels properly labeled and such. That's your pilot lamp there, which is probably in 1847. 
This has no tubes in it. The tubes were missing when it was brought to me, and they look like they've been out of there for some time. You now, typically, the sockets on the tuner don't go bad, so given the pain in the ass factor to replace them in that lesser probability, I think I'm just going to clean them and go with it. So let's get the cover off. That's just uh, the hex nuts down there, and then we should be able to get this apart, take a look inside. All right, so here's the tuner with the cover off. All these little coils and stuff. What we're looking for is little cracks in the phenolic discs. Making sure that there's no breaks or any damage with any of the contact plates. In fact, let me see if I can get in here with the macro. Oh, look, we've got a visitor. It's been living in there for a while. You can't stay in here. Get something to fish you out with. Come on out. Yeah, he didn't want to come out. Just gonna live in there for a little bit. Just wait till the high voltage kicks up. <laughs> Let's see if we can get down in here with the macro. I'm looking at that uh, contact ring there, making sure there's no cracks or breaks in it. And let's see here. Just make everyone dizzy. So far, so good. You also look for phenolic breaks where the rivets go through. I've only seen a couple of them die that way, but... While I'm in here, I want to make absolutely certain. Fair amount of wear on that contact plate. It definitely has some high hours on it for sure. Now you can see the little tin whisker things better. I don't think we have to worry about that really, but there they are. Nice and shiny. Okay, so this seems all right. Phenolic's not cracking or breaking apart. Just taking a look up in there, making sure no cracks on the plastic forms for the coils. Good visual inspection. Saves you a lot of hassle when you wonder what's going on with it. All right, so what we're going to do is clean the contact plates and I'm using uh, some CRC QD because it doesn't leave a residue it's drying I don't use deoxid on tuners if I don't have to because I find with these old tunable slugs here that the deoxid will settle inside and it actually changes the reactants enough to where your tuner will drift and detune so I don't recommend doing that but anyways I'm just going to grab a hold here with the duck bills and we're just going to spray on this contact plate here and then rotate through its positions and we'll repeat the process for the remaining wafers Second one there. All right. Third one.
and then finally the one in the back here. Now the next thing I want to do is just check a couple of these resistors, make sure that none of them are way out of tolerance or anything, because then of course we'll want to replace those too while we're in here. I don't often see tuner failures, I just don't, uh, unless it's been abused. So let's see what this guy here is, this looks like a 470K, measures 524. It's a little high. It will change him. And then here's a uh, 1.5K, which is across a coil. Uh, also, that wafer's a little bit loose. Is there something not holding it there? No, that's good there. Check up top there. It's not cracked there. I guess it's just a little loose. Of course, they all kind of are a little loose, so that's all right. Let's see, and then there was another one, another set on this side here. Let's see, what do we got here? It looks like a 4.7K. .7 47K? Oh yeah, that's an orange stripe. 47K, measuring 60. So that's got to go. And then let's see here, this looks like 68K, measuring 75. These are all just really up there. And I'm going to need to order these because these are, these are fat. 1 watt, 2 watt devices type thing. Uh, where do you, hard to tell what you are. Are you purple or are you brown? You look like you're supposed to be 1.8K. And you're measuring 2.5? Wow. All right. So all of those definitely need to get changed out. And we got another one here. This tube socket up here. Looks like another 470 ohm. And you measure 500, 490 something. So you're still within 10%. Just leave you be. Uh, but these guys here, these big fat guys... For sure got to go and then that oh there's another one the 10k hiding in here you're probably shunting something so i'm never gonna know yeah you're shunting something uh okay and there's another 10k floating up in there let's see what you do you're still almost 10k so you're fine so definitely some work to do on the tuner. And let me check the antenna coil here and make sure that we're alive here. Let me get a good grip on the terminal here. Maybe it's just too badly oxidized. Well, I got that there. Bomb coil here. Hope that's alive. Should be getting something there, right? Or is that just a transformer? Might just be a transformer. And we got a tuning coil. There we go. There's the other end of it. All right, so we're good there. We're good there. Measure it here. I can just get my probe on it. And we're good there. Okay. And then the little tuning inductor here with 
good there. All right. So everyone got to look at my hands for a bit. So let's find us some resistors and replace them. It's not going to be fun to get in here. I may just uh, end up eyeliting it or J hooking it or something. And I got to remember not to put too much pressure on this guy or I'll break him right off. Okay, so 18K, 1 watt, uh, 47K, 1 watt, and then 1.8K, 1 watt. And we should be good to go on this one. All right, so we've got our new resistors in there. And as you can see here, I got a combo here uh, to make the correct value that I wanted for the 1.8k because I didn't quite have 1.8k at 1 watt so I just made one up here the others I did have and although these look like scary old carbon resistors they still measure within 5% so I'm going to use them since I have those on hand so uh, then of course we have to replace the cap on top and then put the cover back on and once we've done that then we can find some tubes for it, clean the tube sockets, and put them in. And then put it in the set. Or actually, not put it in the set yet, but run it all together. And see uh, what comes of that. Alrighty, well there she is all put back together. Got our new decoupling cap up top here. All buttoned up and ready to play. Except for the uh, tuner tubes. Well, let's find out what tuner tubes we need. And get, I may have them in my stash, but if not, uh, I'll order them. According to the SAMs, looks like we need a 6BC8 and a 6X8. Pretty sure I don't have those. Well, unfortunately, the 6BC8's out of stock. I normally order from Vacuum Tubes Incorporated. They're my go-to. He's out of those right now. The 6X8 he's got, though. So I'm going to have to go out to the storage uh, warehouse I have uh, and see if I have uh, one of these in my multitude of things, maybe along with a 6X8. Uh, but for now, everything seems to be ready except for the tubes. Once we get some tuner tubes in it, we should be good to go. All right, so fast forward a day or two. I went out to my storage barn and went through my stuff and found these two guys here. So... Now we can, uh, well, first of all, of course, let's open the boxes and make sure that they're actually what they say they are. Well, a 6x8 is a 6x8, but I'm full of stupid today because I was supposed to get a 6BC8 and I got a 6CB6. Yeah, not even close, but it is what it says it is, so... Uh, Moments of stupid, folks. It does happen. So I got one of the two tubes. Need to go back and look for another one. Alright, so going back, what I found was the 6BZ8, which is basically the equivalent of the 6BC8. Uh, interesting how both of them are Philco's. Kind of like this design, though. The Starlight electron tube pre-tested for enduring performance but wouldn't that mean that they're all worn out by the time you get them and then I've got an older one same number in the older packaging which isn't as cool this is I think 19 early 1950s so let's open them up and compare okay so right away I know I'm not going to use this one this has the infamous green fuzz that's creeping up the pins, and it's already gotten into the glass. And basically what this means is if I use this tube, what will happen is, is the vacuum seal will break on it, and it will fail. Uh, that's too bad. Yeah, it's actually creeping up inside, so not good. Unless, that's anti-corrosive and that's paint. Ugh. All right. Let me, uh, let me ponder that one. Let's see if we can zoom in on it a bit. 
Well, maybe the pins itself is fine and that green stuff is any corrosive. Because it doesn't look like the pin in the envelope itself is uh is messed up. Alright, so maybe that's an option, and maybe it just needs to be cleaned off. And then the other one, pretty clean looking pins. So yeah, I yeah. I don't know. Let's uh let's see if we can clean the green gunk off of that and take a closer look. Yeah, it doesn't clean up. And the green stuff looks like it's inside the glass. Like inside the envelope, which is weird. So I don't know what's going on there. Maybe that's sealant? No, because it doesn't go through the lead there. It doesn't touch any of the leads. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that is. Looks funny to me. But we're going to test them both. Because, you know, sometimes new old stock doesn't always work. Alright, so into the B&K it goes. Let's see if it's lighting up. It is. 55 and 7, socket 7. It's got good emission. And then the second one, surprisingly not the same. Uh, let's check the other one. This is the one with the funky green stuff inside. This is the one that doesn't have the funky green stuff inside. It's lighting up. That one actually scores higher emission. Uh, no second section though, maybe we've got a dirty socket here. Yeah, definitely dirty socket pins. Keep getting this light reflection. There we go. So, pretty good emission on those. Not equal either. I guess that's just is how it is. So, either one I guess will work sufficiently. I am suspicious of the weird green stuff on the inside. So, we'll just clean the pins on this one and stick with this one. But, like, I've never seen this funky green stuff on the inside of a tube. So if somebody can uh, point me in a direction as to why that is, uh, yeah, I'd be grateful. All right, so now we have a fully assembled tuner. New resistors that are in spec, tubes, bypass capacitor there. It's all clean, new pilot lamp. So the big question of the hour is, is does it work? Well, does the whole set work? So now we're going to put everything together and we're going to see if it runs and inject a signal into it and see if we can get a response that way. Uh, because if so, that means that uh, the set's working correctly and we need to put it back in the cabinet and make all the final adjustments. So, exciting times here. Um, I'm really hoping that this thing just works and we don't have to go through any sort of scary crap to make it work. Because uh, given the fact that both tubes were missing, that's kind of weird. Of course, the rectifier was missing when we first got it too, so maybe some shop just cannibalized it for what they wanted, given how hard these are to find. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's time to set it all up and see if it actually runs. All right, so I got our chassis back up on the bench here with the CRT. I've got the tuner hooked up, and I've just got it clumsily wired into my uh, digital set-top box up there, so I'm not sure how clear of a picture we're going to get because I don't have all the fancy adapters and stuff to hook up right now. Uh, but we will be able to see if it runs, which is really what I'm after. I just want to see if it'll produce a picture and then uh, maybe find a little speaker to clip in since the other one's still in the cabinet. But uh, yeah, it's time to Time to see what's going to happen to it next. All right, let's go live. Let's see what it does.
All right, I have a raster. Hard to tell if I have, there we go. There's some snow there. So far, uh, no action. Funny how when I go near this, then we start to see snow. It's like there's a problem with the oscillator running. Yeah, no sign of life whatsoever from that. funny how I get near it. Let's make sure I didn't do something stupid, like put the tubes in the wrong sockets or some such nonsense. Yep, dyslexia strikes again. I had the tubes in the wrong sockets. So let's see how we do now. I had to double check the tube chart. So now we'll, hopefully it'll come up and work. There we go. That looks like real snow there. That is bright. Turn that down a bit. Make that horizontal. There we go. A little less bright there. Okay. Now let's see what our tuner does. Definitely more variance there. Alright, so that's crossing over between 13 and 2. So we've got 2, 3, 4. Alright, so we have no sync right now. Vertical stabilizing. Hey, look at that. That's something. Let's adjust our contrast a little bit. In terms of our brightness. I cannot believe how bright this is. This is, I've never seen one with a new picture tube. Now, like I said, I'm just kind of tapped in here with these lead wires, so we really don't have a proper, uh, we really don't have a proper interface. See if we can adjust our oh, that overloads it for sure. AGC is a little hot, and our horizontal is really touchy. So we need to do the horizontal adjustment and probably also uh, deal with the famous AFC diode, which we haven't changed yet. Uh, but there's a setup procedure for doing that. Vertical is close. Very close. We definitely have some signal issues. It seems to be on the weak side. I'm just kind of toying with the RF adjustments at this point. I'm going to see if I can find my alignment tool kit. Maybe we can do some adjustments on the tuner. I really need to get a better signal into it first though. Let me uh, toy around with this for a little bit. Yeah, so right now, we're just not getting a good signal into it. It's just kind of crummy. Got a little bit of shrinkage there when we do the brightness control. The contrast ratio is also very high. And we got to do the horizontal adjustments. That's really touchy. But so far, so good. Definitely overloading. So we need to work on AGC and other problems like that. But hey, it's alive and it has a picture. So that's a pretty good start. I like where it's going so far. Yeah, so playing around with this, I definitely think there's something going on in the front end of the tuner. 
uh, because no matter where I inject the signal, it only gets moderately better. So I need to re-examine the tuner input here. Because the signal only gets marginally better. But otherwise we have a picture. No matter what we do and I highly doubt that it's just not having the 300 ohm adapter because usually you can get away with that and it won't produce such a nasty picture so I'm not sure really what's going on here unless we've got some weird anomaly that means I have to ground the two chassis together I don't think so I think they're grounded yep that makes no difference Horizontal linearity looks good. Let's take this off the mount here and you can see. But we just have grainy, gross picture right now. Which I'm definitely thinking is a tuner problem. I need to dig up my suburb tuner and see if that's in fact true. Or if there's something else going on here. I also keep smelling what smells like, uh, you know, capacitor pee. But none of the capacitors are leaking. None of them are getting hot. I don't think I missed any. It's been on now for about 20 minutes and it hasn't, uh, hasn't screwed up. Other than the crummy picture. So we need to evaluate the tuner again. And see if we can figure out why it's so crummy. But... Uh, very bright, very sharp picture so far. We just need to figure out if this is the issue or if something in our IF is the issue. Don't really know. I need a substitute tuner signal to find out. But that's where we're at so far. We have a, a picture here. Let's hook a speaker up real quick and see if we have sound. Yeah, we got sound. A little distorted, but we got sound. Inner carrier buzz. Yeah, that's pretty common, so we definitely need to touch up the detectors and stuff. It definitely is overloading. Yeah, it's clearing up a little bit. So it's definitely tuner issues, because if I fiddle with the tuner contacts, it looks a little better. Yeah, definitely sound issues. Great service and pricing you have come to expect. You know who to call. <laughs> Got some under-biasing of the output tube or distortion in the detector. Got to scope that out. It's kind of waking up here. Better looking picture now. But I still think we need to sub this tuner with something else to see if we get a better picture. It is clearing up though. Interesting, huh? So... I might check the uh, IF tubes just in case. These new sockets are awesome. I keep thinking it's a dirty socket, but then I remember I replaced them all except for the tuner. And the tuner, you wiggle it and it really doesn't change anything. Ooh, doesn't like that. Yeah, I definitely need to work on that horizontal. 
horizontal sink is really touchy. What the? Why does it care? Oh, it was just something about how this was tuner was resting there. All right, enough playing around. So it's coming together. We just need to get rid of the grainy picture, figure out what the cause of that is. But that's where we're at so far. More fun in the life of a predicta. So hope you guys enjoyed watching this. And uh, more stuff to come.